Okay, and we're listening from uh, selections from the uh, upcoming release from, from Laura Vetterbush. It's called Tribe Tales for Harp, Original Harp Pieces Based on Jewish Biblical Themes. And, uh, it's, uh, not, it's not an upcoming release. It's actually out there. Oh, there. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, we're trying to build up the uh, hype then, okay? Oh, okay. Okay, let's go along with us, okay? <laughs> anyway, um, any of us, any uh, anybody who's like a regular uh, listener of... Uh, well, All Points TV and also formerly Flint Talk Radio will know Laura Futterbush. If not, we'll introduce her to a new group of people. Um, Laura's a harp harpist, harp player from the Ann Arbor area, but she also covers wide swath of Michigan and Laura. Yeah, and, that's right. <laughs> and Ohio and Indiana. And I have a gig coming up in West Virginia, so yeah. <laughs> that's really far out here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, no. So anyway, it's like uh, we have you sitting there in a beautiful setting there. By the way, I think it looks really great. Anyway, um. So this is like you've been. This is the second thing you've released in short time. Uh, right, yeah. yeah, you've been at the studio quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to compose and create things. I, so there are a lot of things I don't do very easily in life, but I'm um, composing and um, and creating things is is pretty easy for me. So that's good. yeah, it's like and, it's, and also it's like it's kind of connected to your heritage. You know, your uh, your Jewish heritage. You're um, mm -hmm. drawing from that for these for this collection. And how many pieces are there on this? Uh, on uh, this? Is it 16? Or, well, actually, the 16th one, I think, is a reprise of the first one, so it's probably 15, um, 15 different tunes. So it's reprise. Yeah, I've always yeah. heard it as a reprise. So I just, uh, so People might reprise. pronounce it differently. It's yeah, possible. one of those regional things, I guess. Anyway, but um, anyway, it's like you're definitely drawing from the um, your heritage. And uh, now, what can what inspire this? Uh, there's like, you have another small you have a fewer on that you know a fewer songs on that one i think i have it at, all, at my house right yeah uh and it's also based on jewish themes uh, biblical themes uh, no no this is the only one I oh the only, yeah, okay. this is the same one that, that i did before yeah yeah coming in here again to plug it so I, th I think that was when it was more um well i had released it but right now it's on cd baby and itunes and so now i'm i'm trying to really promote it yeah, so I think it's well. I think it's great. I mean, I think it harp uh, harp music something that it's a soothing sound to mm -hmm. it, and uh, I think this would be probably great for like maybe some people sitting around eating dinner. It could have it play in the background, so you know. And I think it sounds great, and I think they're going to be able to, um, you know. I think also too, if they start actually listening to it and the, what inspired it, and going to the Old Testament, mm -hmm. they can see this connection. Now, um, like you, how long have you been involved like, with um? A lot of people I talk to, uh, you know, they have like they have a dormant stage when they, you know, they uh, start maybe connecting with their family's religion, and that seems to be the case. A large number of the Jews I talk to, it's like mm -hmm. basically in their teenage years, their twenties, their thirties, even they were pretty much it was in the background. But at, right. at some point, it starts reemerging. When did this start happening for you? Um, I grew up in a secular Jewish home, and um, there. We um, we were Jews. We, my both my parents were Jews, but they were both secular. They both had broken away from Judaism. We had older relatives who were st were still practicing Jews. So you know, sometimes we'd go go to there, visit them over a vacation or something, and 
go to a Seder or something like that, or um, you know, my grandmother had mezuzahs and things, but I always sort of associated it with older relatives and kind of stuffiness and maybe some superstition. And um, both my parents, you know, were more scientific minded. They were kind of agnostic or atheist. So just, we didn't really, um, we just weren't into religion. It wasn't the thing that we did. And um, I guess both my parents also weren't really into rituals. I, I guess there are Jews who are atheists or agnostic, but, but who enjoy the rituals. My parents weren't like that. And um, I guess for most of my life, I, I wasn't really like that either. Um, at some point, uh, when when I was an adult, I, I lived with my mother, and um, we, we both got in, we were both sort of social activists. We got involved with this um, Jewish protest group that was protesting outside of a synagogue, um, protesting the conditions of the way the Jews were treating the Palestinians, and um, it was. So we would sort of stand in front of the synagogue and hold up protest signs. It's, the group was called Jewish Witnesses for Peace and Friends. They're still out there doing this. And my mom and I got involved at, um, many years ago. And um, anyway, it's a very controversial thing. This is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And you know, a lot of the religious community and the community in general is very much against this kind of protesting because um, it's you know, not fair to the synagogue um, who's always being um, harassed like this. But at the time, my mom and I were very much involved in this. And um, eventually my dad tried to convince me to um, stop doing it. My dad had my stepmom, my stepmom particularly. And you know, for a while I, I, I resisted, but eventually I just stopped just to please them basically. But then, um, very soon after I stopped, I realized that I was glad that I wasn't doing the protesting anymore, and I started to see the group as kind of a cult. Um, you know, there's a particular mindset to the group, like the, um, you know, sort of the Zionists control everything, and uh, the Zionists control the media. And, you know, Zionists meaning Jews basically, but um, Jews who support Israel, and. Um, you know, it just made me see everything through this very hateful kind of lens, and I, I realized I was glad not to be in that group. And then um, a while later, after I, I saw this movie called Atonement, I'm sorry, this is going to be a long story, but um, the movie Atonement by, um, based on the book by Ian McEwan, and, about, and so I, I got this idea of it's important to atone for one's um, things one has done that hurt other people. So I decided to, to atone, and I wrote a letter to the rabbi of the synagogue, which is Beth Israel Congregation in Ann Arbor. And um, Rabbi Doberson was really, really kind, and he wrote me back this nice letter. I thought he was going to write back some really angry thing if he wrote back, you know, like, you know, what have you done? You know, for years and years you were persecuting my congregation, or I, I don't know, I, or else I didn't think he'd write back at all. But he wrote back this really nice letter, and. Um, you know, he invited me to come and talk to him, and I did, and, and I just really liked him, and I, I started going to the synagogue um, just to try it out, and I felt I really liked the synagogue. It, it had beautiful music, um, not instrumental music, just choral music, um, I mean, just the people in the congregation singing along with whoever's leading the prayers, but it's, it was just really beautiful um, tunes, and um, it's all in Hebrew, which made it kind of mysterious, and, and the, the people were all very nice to me. No, you know, no one held it against me that I had once been one of the protesters. They were all very, very kind to me, and I, I just really loved it. And you know, joining the congregation has been one of the best decisions I made in my life. My mom is still one of the protesters, by the way, <laughs> um, so <laughs> we're kind of uh, on opposite ends of the fence on, on that issue. In the same household, that's uh, that's really. You know, I guess it's kind of like reflected throughout, you know, the country. Be you know. As Especially in Jewish families, this was a very, hot, I guess, to say, hot topic. I don't, you know, topic, hot topic amongst that, and it's like, uh, I've, but I find myself actually, I think the, I mean, a lot of people are unaware. They think they're self secular, but they're really unaware of a lot of the metaphors and a lot of the allegories that they're drawing up from every day. The, the concepts are in place in their mind that are actually drawn from. The, what we call the Old Testament, which is, you know, that what would be the Tanakh or the original teachings of the Jews. And it's like, it permeates our culture. I mean, it's like, it's un inescapable, it's undeniable that um, it's actually, sh you know, shaped largely the Western consciousness for like 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. And um, even before, and probably 
probably before the advent of Christianity, Jews are in Europe. And so I think there's it's been an impact. I mean, the East and the West has always been kind of, there's kind of this kind of a dichotomy, I guess, or this kind of... Um, in these uh, paradoxes that are created, but it's a it's a thing that's worked. And I can say this. I mean, it, you know, Christianity, and if you want to look at the Christian a Christian doctrine, a lot of it was fusible to the um, Greek thought and the Hebraic thought came in. There was also in there. The mix has always been there, and that's what the point I'm trying to make is: you don't have to be a religious Jew or a religious Christian to actually draw, or to actually be inspired, or actually have connection to what is taught True. in the in the Jewish Bible. Yeah, and the. On my CD, it's just instrumental music, and it's just based on the the stories of the Jewish Bible. So I'm I'm not there's not an element that I'm trying to convert people or trying to tell them you have to believe in the in that this really happened or that you shouldn't believe it really happened. You know, I don't really um you know I guess people are free to believe or not believe in the stories or have any degree of religiousness they want I'm just um, using those as inspiration for my music but it you know I'm not um, using this as some way to to try to persuade people one way or the other um, I, I just think they're beautiful um, you know beautiful stories that we can learn a lot from and uh, yeah that's it. So can we hear another one here? So um, sure. Okay. Well, I'll. Let this oh, oh, by the way, that first, the first tune I played, I don't know if you remember, that was um, called the Crossing. That's um, supposed to represent the Jews um, crossing the Red Sea to escape the Egyptians, and you know the the sea, um, God parted the Red Sea for them. Um, it was a miracle. And they they crossed it, but then um, when the Egyptians were crossing, um, you know, God closed the the sea again, so they they drowned. So. Um, so that was um, it was a miracle for from the Jews, um, not not for the Egyptians, obviously. <laughs> but um, this next tune I'm going to do is called um, "With Tambourines and with Dancing," and this is the Jewish um, the Jews celebrating after they were um, miraculously delivered across the, the Red Sea, and um, Miriam, who's um, Moses' sister, is leading them uh, um, with her tambourine. And, um, you know, of course, it's one of the things we sort of joke about, you know, why, why did she have a tambourine? How, you know, how did Miriam happen to bring a tambourine with her when she was escaping the Egyptians? You know, who knows? But um, anyway, so this is with tambourines and with dancing. This is their celebratory song. Thank you. 
So that, that listening to that, it's like I can actually. I don't know if you ever thought of this, but I mean, I can actually see this being like the basis for maybe kind of a, for lack of a better term, like but an opera. I mean, about <laughs> about, about this because I mean that music that right there. I mean, I can definitely see there. There's a joyfulness to that, you know, that piece, and there's like a, you know, and that's like and when you when you already t explained it, but I mean, even just hearing it when I first heard it before, the, you know, knowing the context, it was like a, there's a joyfulness to that piece. So. Oh, thank you. I, I love opera, so I take that as a compliment. Well, I, I know people either love or hate opera. But I happen to love it. So. Well, well, I think Americans and I think a lot of people nowadays have the concept, the conception that it's like a snobby thing, and it's like when I I used to have a Shakespeare a teacher of a Shakespeare plays over there at U of M. Dr. Wesley Ray, I'll give him a prop wherever he's at. I hope he's still around. He retired years so, ago. Yeah. Um, he actually desnobified Shakespeare because he said everybody wants to put it, like, you know, it's now performed in places like really, you know, fancy places and people dress up to go see it. But he said back then that was when it was written, it was, a, it was for, the, I mean, the Globe Theater, you know, a lot of people there just had enough money to get in. They paid their their price and they saw this. And it was a, it was the it was the soap operas of the time. Yeah. And uh, so it's just like opera, that's where they get the soap opera from. The operas did have a lot of, you know, themes, like, you know, from classical, star, uh, classical world, as well as, like, uh, you know, stuff was going on in the everyday. They talked about the everyday. They sang about it, rather. And, it is, I mean, they we made it, somebody's made it pretentious. Right. And I have this theory about Shakespeare, which I, I don't know if anyone else has, has been thinking along these lines or not. Or, um, this might be sacrilegious to say, but I think someone should do a versions of the Shakespeare plays in actual modern English. I know people have done it in modern settings, you know, like... Um, you know, with uh, trying to update it with fancy, you know, or not fancy, with um, more modern hip costumes and, you know, using guns and revolvers and all, ki all kinds of things to, you know, helicopters and make it more current contemporary. But I think they should actually update the language, but still have it be, ver be clever and poetic. And it would, you know, it would still be Shakespeare. But right now, um, Shakespeare is written in a language that's not even, um, it's not even the same language anymore. It's a different version of English. I think it could be done in contemporary temporary language, but still, um, you know, just like a translation from a Russian novel. I've read, you know, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. I read it in English. It's not the same language, but it's the same book. And I think so, that same thing should be done with Shakespeare because so that people will understand it. And, um, you know, I think, I don't, I don't think, um, I, I think it would actually keep the, the plays alive if it were done well. It would have to be done well, so. Well, see, I agree with you to a certain extent. I think, see, I'm a, I'm a purist. I like this costume and I like the language <laughs> of that era, though, that era, you know, Elizabethan English. I mean, that era to me, it's like, you know, I, I also grew up on the King James Version of the Bible, which is mm -hmm. also Elizabethan English, or actually it was under the King James era, but that was soon after Elizabeth. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I have appreciation for it, but I, um, but so many themes and stuff like that, like, you know, you know, star-crossed lovers, parents, or, you know, the, the two families don't want them to. That's been repeated so many times, you know. Mm -hmm. West Side Story, for example. Right, yeah. And I, that, was, that was the first play that I actually seen, you know, you know, a live play that I ever saw take place. My friend's brother played the lead role, you know, in that, in that play, and I was like 9, 10, 11 years old, so I can't remember exact age. But, I mean, I remember seeing that, and I was like, wow, and then my mom said, well, that's just basically a retelling of, you know, Romeo and Juliet. Right, yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, and, it's, and those themes, I mean, uh, Bloom wrote a book called about basically about how Shakespeare actually taught us how to make see people in types of personalities and ahead right. and it's an excellent book. I never f fully finished the book because it just he goes through and he breaks he looks at the, these different plays by Shakespeare and examines the the key characters and what their types were and that's how we start coaching people. I mean the, the, the rise of individuality certainly came right on the heels of Shakespeare. I mean, the rise of, you know, the, the respecting of the individual and trying to examine the individual, I think is definitely, I mean, modern day psychology, you know, psychotherapy and everything, I think has got a big, big, you know, kudo to, uh, you know, right. William Shakespeare. So, yeah, I mean, sure. so, I mean, so I, so I see things as interconnected, whereas a lot of people would say you're being pedantic, you're just being or pedantic or whatever, you're, you're just trying to draw too much together, but it, I see there is a lot of things that are tied together. Right, that's but, true. But I yeah, saw they're, they're, they're sort of timeless stories in the same way that the the Bible stories are are timeless. Well, th that's the point exactly. See, mm -hmm. we've all I mean I've read some of the class, you know, myths of like Greeks and Romans, and there is some kind of theme about you know like especially when you talk about say Pendar, I mean not Pendar, um, 
when you talk about uh, Sisyphus, you know, his rebellion against God and his, his sentence, basically, for trying to challenge the gods and their powers. Mm -hmm. um, those are things that are universal. I mean, we all, we all strove against something we've had or have had people you know, trying to overcome some you know tremendous obstacle, and that becomes basically something like you can draw into this kind of that that current struggle. But I think that um, I think the Bible though the one thing that's unique about that is the humans in that there wasn't several petty gods in the in the Ju Jewish Bible, the Jewish world. This God actually always had what he expected from you to do for him, but what he expected how you treat other people. And that's, you know, basically the Ten Commandments could be mm -hmm. basically summed up. The first few are how you deal with God, the rest are how you deal with other people and yourself. So, I mean, that's one thing I've always found that's like, um, I think that's basically more believable than the the pettiness of the Greek, the Greek and the Roman gods. Mm -hmm. They're very petty. I was I, still into Greek and Roman mythology as a kid. I, I just loved reading those stories. Well, I, do, I do too, but I mean, they're petty. I mean, it's like they're, sure, they're yeah. very petty. I mean, they, they will actually do horrific deeds against man against each other mm -hmm. basically for the slightest the slight, a slight you know right. the, the, you know but uh you didn't see that in the god of the uh, the jews right you know? he basically you knew up front what he wanted he wasn't like fickle he wasn't or you know he wasn't he wasn't subtle about what he demanded he knew he put it right out there whereas the greeks the con the you never knew what did they do this themselves, or you know that's the old basis of some philosophy is, or whatever is like is this because it's good because the gods demand it, or because they actually commit and do this? I mean, and there's a lot of things that they did. I certainly won't want a human to do. Right, and, and the God of the Bible loves us, and the, the Greek gods and the Roman gods of, you know, the people were just sort of there as their playthings. It's not clear that there was. The, the gods really cared about people to any great degree. So. There's there are periods of that, and there are different stories and different right, things. Yeah. But yeah, you, like there's a, there, there's like remorse for maybe being so so uh, silly or stupid or uh, capricious, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's not the re that's not the constant personality of the gods. Right. Yeah. So I mean, that's the reason why I have it. I mean, just on a sheer, if you just want to look at examine that way, maybe that's my own bias. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll permit that. I mean, it's like, but uh, I think the, the God of, because let's face it, the Christians are going to defend the Jewish God because that's the same God right, for yeah. us. So, I mean, but anyway, it's, I think there's themes, though. I mean, I think there, a lot of, like I was alluding to earlier, a lot of people just don't um, want to acknowledge or even see the forest of the trees, I guess, of how much your consciousness is formed by the Old Testament. Right. And people take Bible studies classes, even if they're not religious, just because it gives them a greater understanding of, like you said, you know, musicals they might see or, or books they might read. Or if you're watching a TV show, there will be some reference to some character from the Bible. You just, in order to be, be sort of literate in any, um, in our modern culture, you have to have some knowledge of, of the Bible. So anyway, that could, uh, I'll tell you what, we'll uh, have here, if you're ready, we'll have, mm -hmm. see if we can hear another piece here, and then we'll also come back and maybe give some commentary on that, and then, um, you know, also we want to give out the information too, at the when we was wrapping sure. this up, to you know, where people can find your work and how they contact you, and uh, so, okay, we'll hear the, you know, we'll hear this another piece, and we'll continue from there. Okay, this is called Smoke on the Mountain, and this represents, um, before God gives Moses the tablets with the Ten Commandments, um, the, he goes up on the mountain and the, the people see um, thunder and, or, well, they hear thunder, they, they see lightning and smoke and um, it's, it's very mysterious and um, they know something very exciting and overwhelming is about to happen and they don't know what, but this, this is about that experience. This is, um, you know, you've probably heard of the rock song, Smoke on the Water, so this is Smoke on the Mountain.
Very beautiful. Oh, thank you. Now, I, it's, I, like I said, I, would, I don't know if you ever give it much thought, but as I'm hearing these pieces, I mean, I could see these put together in some kind of opera or some kind of, um, I don't know, I guess a musical probably, but the thing musical nowadays usually is like, you know, like Jesus Christ Superstar. I wonder, <laughs> that's what comes to mind when people hear the word musical or cats. Okay, you're right, yeah. But I mean, I can see this, uh, I mean, but I can definitely see this music as... I don't know if I can see words being put to it, but I can see that as the development of the story goes on being put, you know, okay. hearing that. So that's where I'm hearing yeah. it. Of course, I'm a novice in this stuff. So. <laughs> I and like it, multimedia kinds of things. So that well, that's, like that's, a good idea. that's what I kind of specialize in, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's about <laughs> multimedia. So that's, that's I guess that's what we call this, what we do here at um, you know, All Points is kind of a multimedia thing. You know, it's yeah. kind of radio, kind of TV. And we got special effects now, you know. Which, you know, we're actually looking like you're sitting here in Wilson Park there, you know, by downtown, you know. Oh, yeah. Where the <laughs> picture is, yeah. Look at all the trees, yes. Yeah. And actually, I was just down, like I said to, to you, I was like down there earlier today, and mm -hmm. it is pretty much the same kind of day as when I took those pictures, so. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, um, it's, uh, I'm definitely, I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that people actually don't totally just walk away or totally forget their own heritage. And uh, it's like, um, I think that's. I can't. I can't think of my own life without actually having connection to uh, Bible stories and actually the t the lessons or the, the the actually the struggles that's actually depicted in them, you know. Right. And uh, I think that basically, even though some people want to dismiss that as like outdated, I really don't see the struggle being outdated. The resolution possibly or the potential for resolution and the ways it could be done might have opened up. But I still think the struggles and the um, the the issues are still largely the same right and i guess as jews we reread the um I guess this is triennial cycle we um go through the entire all of the holy books once every th um three years i, th I think it is i'm, I'm not ex expert on these things yet but um every time you reread it you bring new experiences like you're at a different point in your life or for whatever reason, the story might hit you in a different way. So we're supposed to look for different things in it every time, every time we read it. It's not supposed to be the same old thing, you know. It's, it keeps changing, and um, you know, we we keep changing. So well, I, th I think that's what we're taught is when we're going to church. That's what they teach you too. Is like someday you're going to read a passage, and it's going to it hit a different chord entirely. Mm -hmm. and it's like another thing is too. It's like um, the power of a, of a the all the all powerful creator is like. Let's face it. It's the 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 it's like mind-boggling if you just want to look in scientific terms if you, it, this this force created this this god created everything mm -hmm. then the amount of intelligence amount of knowledge he possessed but also the potential for all the the energy that we still enjoy the benefit of that was created by the act of creation and another thing is so strange too is like in other myths the gods actually take something and they shape it with their hand or they they um throw something and it breaks apart or whatever there's different stories but in the Hebraic God, the Hebraic God speaks the world into existence. And you know, did you ever know, did you ever re reflect on that? It's like he speaks into existence, and that's where he, I mean. And I, the books I've read, you know, Isaac Bashir Singer, he mentions other works in his works, and basically that's where the Jews get the 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 stress on words and uh, vocabulary and languages. There's such a love and appreciation for that because their God spoke the world into existence. Not, he didn't take a ball of clay and thump it together, or he didn't have sex with another animal, another <laughs> creator, or something like that to ha create the world. He spoke into existence. Right, and you gave me that book that talks about the different letters. Uh, um, I guess some people ha have different ideas about what each letter in the Jewish alphabet was supposed or the Hebrew alphabet was supposed to represent. So the, the letters themselves were very significant to, along with the words. So, I mean, that's like, it's like, so, I mean, I can totally, I'm not Jewish, but I've, you know, I've studied it pretty well. And I know that, I mean, there's just a lot more to learn, obviously. I mean, I'd probably know what would fit into a matchbook, but I mean, <laughs> in comparison, but I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot to draw from. And I, I see that with Christianity too a lot. I mean, I, I think the Christians have actually, they've put the felt board for Sunday school to, you know, they put up a felt board and they put a picture of Jesus who looks like a hippie with robes. <laughs> and, uh, and they actually, and I call it the felt board Jesus syndrome. You know, they don't realize it's the, the almightiness, the intense thing, the possible possibility of this omniscience. It's just, the, you're, you're basically limiting this child to, it's a good story and they can learn on that level. But when you looked at the thing, story, what the potential behind that is, or all that power and all that, the, um, I don't know. It, I, I, it escapes me, though. But the words of it, that's the problem is when you just see it depicted in that manner, you do learn from it. But 
not to the depth I think that should, makes that much of an impact on many people. Right, that's true. So anyway, um, where could people find your uh, CD and or get the uh, get Let's your music? See. It's available now through CD Baby, I guess CDBaby.com, iTunes, and um, I think it will be on Amazon.com, but I don't think it's there yet. But to keep you can keep looking there. But as of now, it is on CD Baby and iTunes. And you can also you've seen you're also doing um, local. You make them almost like weekly appearances in the Ann Arbor area, right? <laughs> oh, I play at the um, Grand Traverse Pie Company that's on Zeeb Road. Um, I play there Mondays and Thursdays, 11.30 to 1.30, and during the summer also on Sundays, 11.30 to 1.30. I have a conflict this on August 9th, so don't show up if you're just coming to see me on August 9th, although you can go there to have pie. But... Um, yeah, Mondays and Thursdays, and during the summer, Sundays, except for August 9th, 11.30 to 1.30. Oh, I, I just want to mention before I got them, my CD won, I, I won a prize um, with my music fraternity, um, Mu Phi Epsilon, um, for um, composing the the music for the, for the CD, so I'm very honored um, that they gave me the prize for that. And also, you could be found on Facebook. Right. And you can also be now would you prefer people go through the you know your uh, agent for booking or would you want them to directly approach you or um yeah the um the, yeah they could they could book me like if they're booking me for a wedding or i do weddings and other events so yeah they could go through um rush entertainment rush entertainment so i'll we'll also provide that information you know, on that's the, r-u-s-c-h on entertainment so anyway um i wish you uh, you know great success on uh, you know hope you sell a lot of these cds and get people get your get your music out there and um, definitely, maybe maybe consider the idea because yeah, I know you work among some uh, very musical people. Maybe coming up with maybe find a way of making this come like an opera or something <laughs> like that. But um, anyway, thanks again. Thanks again, and um, I hope to see you very again very soon. And um, do you want to play a piece on the way out? Yeah, thanks, John. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, this is called "I Knew You Before You Were Born." This is God talking to the prophet Jeremiah. Who um, was a reluctant prophet, and God's trying to coax him and urge him to um, do, do his bidding. So this is, I knew you before you were born. Mm-hmm. 